Welcome everyone to the, uh, to the seminar, to one more seminar series on mathematics and machine learning. We're very happy today to have Jonas Latz. But Jonas did his PhD in uh, Munich. Um, he is now a, um, a postdoc in Cambridge. Um, um, and oh, second, need to move the screen around. He's going to talk to us today about analysis of static gradient descent in continuous time. So thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I quite like these, quite like these like new uh, new online seminars that we we have everywhere. I mean, now that like conference are not a thing at the moment, or are also online. So it's really lovely that uh, that you're putting a lot of work in to setting these up. And yeah, and thanks to invite me to speak about stochastic gradient descent. Um, exactly. So. Uh, there is a preprint associated to this talk, uh, having the same title, and you can find it in the archive or on my webpage. Or, um, well, I mean, if you cannot just Google my name, I guess that would be sufficient. Um, so, if you have, yeah, if you have like during the talk or after the talk any questions, just I mean, during the talk, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, I probably won't re read. Uh, what, you write, what you write in the chat, but uh, I guess somebody is just interrupting me and then uh, anyways when somebody posts a question. And if not at the end, there will also be some time for questions. Yeah, so uh, please don't worry or yeah, drop me an email. Okay, um, brief outline. So we start with the motivation. I mean, first off, why would we do some analysis of stochastic gradient descent and why do we do it in continuous time? Um, essentially. Then uh, how do we actually get uh, stochastic gradient descent in continuous time? And this is like the second part modeling. Then once you have this model, we'll study uh, long-term behavior, yeah, which will give us information about convergence of our stochastic gradient descent. And then we'll try to get back from the continuous time setting to, to discrete time setting. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully see what we've learned um, in the previous parts. And then, yeah, of course, there will be some conclusions and some outlook and take home messages, hopefully. Okay, let's start with stochastic gradient descent. And I assume most of you have seen this before. Um, so the basic idea is we want to solve an optimization problem of this form. Yeah, so we minimize such a potential uh, phi bar. And this potential phi bar is given as uh, the mean of um, n other potentials. And okay, and we will assume that they're all like sufficiently smooth, like in C1 or later we'll actually need C2. Um, and yeah, and I will call these just um, um, potentials. You could also say, say they're uh, log likelihoods or loss functions or maybe energies, um, depending what your, what your background is. And uh, this minimizer, I will sometimes call a true parameter uh, because I'm like an inverse problems person. And so the minimizer is usually like some kind of truth uh, or, yeah, or not even the truth. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, please be kind if I say true parameter to theta star uh, sometimes. Um, and we're usually in finite dimensions. Uh, so X will be just a space R to the K. Uh, yeah, and I mean, you probably all know um, how this how this is meant. Yeah, I mean, usually this will be some some loss function and a loss function of some say machine learning model uh, versus uh, some data set, and theta is a set of parameters of the machine learning model. Yeah, and then we say okay, we don't take all the data, but we take only a bit of the data and sum them up, yeah, and then we have lots of other potentials considering only parts of the data. Yeah, or log likelihoods considering only part of the data or negative log likelihoods actually. Okay, so far so good. Um, if we have such a problem, um, a very um, popular algorithm uh, uh, to solve such a problem is stochastic gradient descent as proposed by uh, Robbins and Monroe in 51. Um, and I mean, what we would normally do is uh, we would do a gradient descent with regard to this potential, but in stochastic gradient descent, um, we do these gradient descent steps um, here with randomly uh, chosen potential. Yeah, so we sample 
which potential are we choosing? So which of these potentials uh, do we choose? And then we just do our gradient step with regard to this potential. And yeah, and we do this until the end of time, or I mean, hopefully with the termination criterion. And um, one important thing to note, uh, there is this sequence eta k of so-called learning rates or step lengths. Um, and uh, if that goes to zero, and if uh, these um, potentials are um, strongly convex, then we actually have a chance of converging to uh, theta star, to the true value. Um, while we do this, um, I mean, we only need to compute one gradient uh, of one of these potentials, not of all of them. And we need to consider only one data set um, at a time, and especially in the large scale imaging, for instance, where um, data can be just super memory, uh, um, super expensive in terms of memory. Uh, this can be very, very beneficial. Okay. Um, from a probabilistic point of view, and that is a point of view that hasn't been taken very often in stochastic gradient descent, even though it is called stochastic gradient descent, um, stochastic gradient descent constructs a Markov chain. Yeah, I mean, we start at some value that can be deterministic or random, and then we construct a sequence of these values um, with these updates. And these updates are random, but they always depend only on the step exactly one value before. Yeah, which gives us a Markov chain. And interesting properties of Markov chains um, are, for instance, stationary distribution, um, ergodicity. So um, do we converge to a stationary distribution? And for instance, speed of convergence. Yeah, so how fast do we converge to a stationary distribution? And uh, this has been studied a bit in the past, but not uh, 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 too much. And I will try to give some answers in this talk about these, these points. Um, Long-term goals would be, um, okay, if we can understand this, this might actually help us to construct more efficient stochastic optimization algorithms, uh, because that is one problem of stochastic gradient descent. Um, it's kind of slow, yeah? So it converges at like, uh, I think one over squared of uh, uh, t, yeah? t is a uh, number of time steps, yeah, but it's very slow. So there's uh, some work, some work needed. Um, then um, kind of starting as the classification descent, we like to do some subsampling steps also in many other methods. Yeah, there's many other methods that are sort of derived from this stochastic gradient descent. So if we understand it here, maybe it's also easy to understand it elsewhere. And finally, I mean, I said we have a chance of converging in, uh, in the strongly convex setting. Um, we actually see that stochastic gradient descent is quite useful also in non-convex settings. And even though I won't get too much in, into those today, um, that obviously is a very interesting question of why is that the case? Okay, why do it in continuous time? Um, so the easy answer is uh, it's easier. Um, and uh, that is the case uh, because there's no uh, numerical artifacts, um, uh, basically. Yeah, I mean, if we analyze this, we don't only analyze some dynamical system, but we actually analyze a discretized dynamical system. Yeah, so we also need to understand what the Euler step that we have here is doing. And by doing it in continuous time, we don't have this. And actually, continuous time models are super popular. Yeah, I mean, the area of continuum mechanics uh, um, is built on the idea that sometimes a con uh, continuous model in time or space is easier to analyze than uh, a discrete model uh, handling atoms or molecules. Um, and also in data science, machine learning, and this kind of, I mean, uh, uh, this whole area that we're interested in here um, has also looked at continuous time or continuous space models um, very often, especially very recently. Yeah, and I mean, for a longer time, I think in PDE-based image reconstruction, yeah, so that's started like in the 90s. Um, but uh, like graph algorithms, for instance, um, um, in continuous time or continuous space are quite popular now. And also stochastic gradient descent has been discussed in continuous time. And 
the idea there usually is that um, by replacing the actual potential phi bar by this, uh, we make an error here. And okay, and if we assume that this error is um, approximately Gaussian, um, we can represent our trajectory by a diffusion process, yeah, something like this. Um, and this view has been taken quite a couple of times, has been analyzed, and I'm not actually sure whether there are some, some like convergence um, proofs of this actually converging to a diffusion, but I think that should be possible if you just let the learning rate go to zero. I think I could imagine that's possible. Um, and that's a very interesting view, but it's not exactly the view that I would like to take here. Um, because first off, um, by just replacing this up to something by, by diffusion, uh, we get rid of this sort of discrete nature that we have in the subsampling, yeah, by really having different potentials we sample from, uh, or different, different data subsets. Um, and we replace this by just adding some noise, which may or may not reflect uh, the data um, at the end. The other thing is, if um, eta k is small, I guess diffusion is a good idea. If eta k is large, it's not a good idea. And if eta k is constant even, yeah, which in practice many people are using stochastic gradient descent with constant eta k, um, we may not have something that is very close to a diffusion. Yeah, it may actually be quite different from a diffusion. Um, and uh, another important thing, especially uh, when thinking of non-convex problems, uh, the pre-asymptotic phase, uh, yeah, so where eta k is still large, is obviously not represented very well by a diffusion process. And the other thing is, um, yeah, and I mean, that's essentially what I said in the beginning, uh, this like whole subsampling idea is not really contained anymore, if just replacing it by noise. Yeah, so what I want to do is I want to give you a, what I think is a better model for, con, uh, for SGD in continuous time, analyze this model and try to see what this gives us for discrete time SGD. Okay. Um, so um, uh, two fundamental observations are, and one I dropped already actually, is this update step in stochastic gradient descent is a forward Euler discretization of some gradient flow. And this gradient flow is this flow. Yeah, so uh, the derivative of theta um, equals minus this potential ik. Yeah, so not the uh, uh, potential bar, yeah, phi bar, but this ik, ik's potential. Um, yeah, okay, and this sort of gives us a continuous time idea already, yeah, by replacing this by this gradient flow. The other thing, the other observation is, the learning rate actually has two different meanings. Yeah, because okay, the learning rate here is just a step size, but the learning rate also determines um, how long we train our model with regards to a certain potential. Yeah, because that is like how long we follow uh, sort of the flow um, with regards to a particular potential phi i. So, um, and that is why I try to um, differentiate between calling this step length or step size and calling this actually a learning rate. Yeah, because learning rate makes a lot of sense for this, not so much for this. And the idea is now um, we let this step size eta k go to zero. So we replace the forward oil discretization by this gradient flow but we still switch the potentials, yeah, so uh, these phi ik's in this gradient flow at a certain rate. And this rate is not just uh, essentially zero plus noise as in a diffusion case, but is something strictly positive or not infinity plus noise. Um, and how do we formalize this? Um, so what we could do, but we won't do is uh, just uh, okay, we have this learning rate, so we can just uh, uh, take like the positive numbers and split them in, in intervals according to how long these are. But that's not a very sensible idea because we will lose a lot of structure. Instead, we actually define a process that depends on T that tells us which potential we take at which time. And this process is a continuous time Markov process. Um, continuous time Markov process on this set uh, of indices. And continuous microprocess means it is a piecewise constant process. 
um, where these uh, uh, distances, so the points uh, between the jumps, um, are sampled from a waiting time distribution. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not sure whether everybody's familiar with continuous Markov processes, but maybe you actually know what a Poisson process is. Yeah, so the Poisson process is like the simplest of the, this class. The difference is just that in a Poisson process, you can only go up uh, and only one step at a time, so you cannot go down. Um, and you are um, on like Z plus, yeah, including zero, not including zero, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, and here in the Poisson process, these waiting times will be exponentially distributed. In our case, they are sometimes exponentially distributed and sometimes they're not. Yeah, so that depends a bit on what you want to do. Um, but that essentially is the idea that uh, tells us at which time do we take which, which potential. Yeah, we control this by such a process. Um, and actually, we do look at two different versions yeah, because we said that constant learning rate is kind of popular. So we take one where this waiting time distribution is constant in time. Uh, so it does not change as the distribution does not change as time goes on. And uh, decreasing learning rate case where these waiting times get smaller in some sense. Yeah, so their mean gets smaller, you could say. Um, and I will give you an example very soon of how this looks. Okay, um, to define these continuous Markov processes, we need like that transition rate matrices. It's not too important to understand this right here. I will tell you in a minute what the implications are of these matrices looking like this. Just the only important thing is um, in here's our eta, yeah, which is like a constant learning rate. And here is our function h of t, which I didn't define yet. But obviously since eta k was like a, 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 like a discrete sequence, uh, but we now actually need, need a function h of t that sort of interpolates the sequence yeah, because we're now in continuous time. And we assume that this is um, um, uh, Lipschitz. Yeah, so you could take just like a linear spline interpolation if you wanted to. Okay, and then we can finally define our stochastic gradient process. Yeah, that is how I call this continuous time model by just saying, okay, we have our um, different continuous time Markov processes and uh, we just solve this ODE with this um, Markov process telling us which potential, um, which gradient flow essentially we are following at which time. And there's again two versions. One is the constant learning rate case, one is the decreasing learning rate case. Um, so this is the one that probably people uh, use most, yeah, like constant learning rate. And this is where we actually have a chance of converging to a minimum or to our, yeah. I will, uh, yeah, I will not repeat again that I call this true value sometimes. Um, and this one we call theta, this one we call psi, and this constant learning rate case is called i and the decreasing learning rate. So the continuous cycle process is called i, and here it's called uh, j. And these processes are almost really well defined if um, yeah, these phi i are in C1 and if their gradients are Lipschitz continuous, yeah, which is essentially just Pika Lindelof. How does this look? Um, so I plotted again here our process i of t. Yeah, it's the same one as before. And um, our process theta of t um, now is the gradient flow for each of these, like whenever this is constant, uh, we just follow one gradient flow. Um, whenever this jumps, we also jump in the right-hand side of our, of our ODE. Yeah, so we then follow a different gradient flow. Yeah, and this changes over time uh, with each jump. Um, this kind of processes has actually quite a big history in uh, stochastics or maybe stochastic analysis, you could even say. Uh, they're so-called piecewise deterministic Markov processes. Why piecewise deterministic? I mean, in these areas, we are completely deterministic and the only random thing happens is uh, that after a random time, we switch the right instead of our ODE. Yeah, but piecewise, we are still deterministic. And they were introduced by a um, person uh, named Davis in 1984. And um, 
they are quite well studied in the literature actually, especially this type of process, which is also a reason why I choose this type of model, yeah, because that is well understood. Um, it's used especially in biology. I've seen a lot of, uh, of these models in biological papers. <clears throat> and recently it has been uh, quite popular also in the MCMC literature actually. Yeah, so on a non-reversible MCMC algorithms, you also find algorithms of this type. Okay, um, why is this model a good model? Um, yeah, I mean, I just threw mathematical terms at you so far. So I want to explain why I think that this is a good idea. So first off, and uh, I mentioned this already, um, we replace our discretized gradient flow by an actual gradient flow. Okay, um, fair enough, I guess. Um, then in the in SGD, we sample uniformly from our um, fr from our potentials, yeah, from our index set. Um, by our choice of these transition rate matrices, that I didn't really explain. Um, we also get uh, this uniform sampling. Yeah, so at each time uh, t, um, these processes will be will be uniform samples. Yeah, we represent uniform samples. Um, one other point is we still have a Markov process. Yeah, I mean, okay, I kind of dropped this information already by saying that uh, these are piecewise deterministic Markov processes, but indeed they are also continuous time Markov processes. Okay, this is a discrete time Markov process, um, but it is kind of one reason why we uh, choose this substance strategy according to such a Markov process because it gives us a lot more structure uh, and allows us to retain this Markov property. Um, okay, and then it gets more critical uh, because in stochastic gradient descent, we wait deterministic, deterministic uh, time interval before we switch our, uh, our data subset, um, which, okay, we can translate to we switch with the rate of one over eta k. And we can also compute a switching rate or a kind of switching rate in our um, continuous Markov processes. And the switching rate will be the um, uh, rate of events that happen at some time. Yeah, and the rate of events happening at some time is given by the hazard function. And we've chosen the hazard function exactly such that we again switch with such a rate. Yeah, and this is again also determined by how we choose these matrices A and B. Okay, and one last point, and maybe like the most philosophical of all of these. Um, so uh, when Romans and Monroe um, wrote their paper, they actually called it um, um, a stochastic optimization um, approximation method, not optimization, but approximation method. And the question is, what do they actually approximate? So one could argue that what they approximate with their method is the actual gradient flow that we have. Okay, they actually didn't optimize, they tried to find a, a minimum. So it's not really a gradient flow in their setting, it's more like a functional flow. Yeah, I don't know how to call that. Um, but um, in our setting where we minimize, uh, we can say that with stochastic gradient descent, we try to approximate this true gradient flow uh, with the actual potential. Um, yeah, and I'm also not actually not sure whether you can, uh, whether this has, this has been, been proven, but I'm quite sure you can show that this is actually true, that um, if you let uh, eta go to zero, you actually converge to this true gradient flow. Um, this is definitely true for uh, the stochastic gradient process with constant learning rate. Um, yeah, we just need a bit more smoothness for our uh, phi i, so we need them to, to be in C2 actually now, and we need the gradient and Hessian to be continuous and bounded on bounded subspace of x. Then we can show that as eta goes to zero, um, our stochastic gradient process converges weakly uh, to the actual uh, gradient flow. Okay, so if eta gets small, um, our process approximates yeah, what would converge really fast to, to, the, uh, to the true value or to the optimal value. Um, 
and this just converges as uh, as eta goes to zero. Yeah, so this property of of approximating the true gradient flow we also retain in our method. And this proof uses a so-called perturbed test function theory that uh, I will come back to later, maybe briefly, that uh, Kushner introduced in his book in 1984, which is really a fascinating book. I can just, uh, everybody who's interested in piecewise deterministic uh, Markov process should look at this book. Okay, and we can also like look at the graph and see what happens. So I uh, came up with a very simple example. There are just two different potentials and uh, we should converge somehow to zero. And I plotted the actual gradient flow in green and I plotted samples of the stochastic gradient process for different, uh, for different eta. And we see as eta gets smaller, we really approach this actual gradient flow. So that's consistent with our theory. Okay, um, one thing I actually also find quite fascinating is uh, I said before that um, these um, piecewise deterministic Markov processes um, appear in biology a lot. Um, and actually, there's one that uh, represents bed hatching in clonal populations uh, that is very, very similar to what we are doing. Yeah, and that's actually very nice. I, if you're interested in this, please, uh, um, please let me know. I would really be interested in learning more about mathematical biology. And there's like a longer text in the paper about this, but uh, I don't want to go too much into this um, here right now. Okay, now finally, I guess uh, we now sort of all agree that uh, this is, um, a good model for stochastic gradient descent, so we can now get on to actually analyzing it. Okay, there's been a bit of analysis already. So what I want to know is um, what happens with uh, theta or psi yeah, with our processes when t gets very large. Yeah, so as time goes on, um, are there unique uh, stationary measures? Yeah, are there stationary measures at all? Are they unique? Yeah, so um, is there something when, uh, so if one of these has this distribution, it wouldn't change anymore afterwards. Uh, and are we actually converging to those stationary measures? Yeah, so for instance, for the fixed line rate case, this could mean that um, after some time, if you reach this stationary measure very, very quickly, um, we don't actually need, need to run it anymore yeah, because we just draw more samples from the same distribution, but they don't actually get better. And okay, do we converge to these? And especially for the, for the decreasing learning rate case, do we actually converge to our true value, yeah, to the minimum of this, uh, this function? Yeah. And um, we measure convergence in this kind of specific Wasserstein distance. Um, and um, yeah, what is specific about it is we don't have just some, uh, some Euclidean distance in here, but it's actually this um, metric that yeah, doesn't look very nice, but it has a nice property that uh, convergence in this Wasserstein metric is actually equivalent to weak convergence. Um, yeah, so I mean, usually you would need to uh, um, um, I mean, usually, usually you have not equivalence to weak convergence, but you have, it implies weak convergence and convergence of uh, the moment, yeah, of the moment, which is like the P that would be behind here somewhere. Um, but it also means to measure the distance between your two measures, you also need this moment to be finite, yeah, otherwise it's not defined, while this Wasserstein distance is just, um, uh, it's just always defined for two community measures. Um, how this works, I should probably say, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say this, I'm sorry. Um, so, okay, we want to know the distance between our two measures, um, pi and pi prime. So we look at, at all the couplings of pi and pi prime, and um, we take the coupling uh, of these that gives, that gives us the minimal, uh, the, uh, the minimum cost uh, transport, where the cost is measured in this, in this norm. And this cost of transport is then um, the value of our Wasserstein distance. Okay, 
uh, two assumptions we need. I mentioned this assumption before, uh, so we need this one, this one again. Uh, so our file eyes need to be pretty smooth and we need continuous um, and bounded um, gradient and Hessian. Okay, that's already uh, in here. Um, but they need to be bounded on bounded sub subsets of X. Also, what I'm assuming, and uh, I hope everybody is okay with this at this point, at least, uh, we need strongly convexity of the phi i's. Yeah, so that's also the case where we understand the classic gradient descent for uh, like the, cl in the classical setting. Uh, but obviously, uh, the non-convex case is far more interesting for application. Okay, then what we get is for the constant learning rate case, um, our process has a unique stationary measure that I call pi c. And uh, there are constants, uh, kappa prime, c, and q, such that this Wasserstein distance between our process and uh, this measure is bounded by this exponential term times yeah, a very long constant, which is nice because it means that we, we are exponentially ergodic yeah, or geometrically ergodic um, in, uh, in the Wasserstein distance. Yeah, so our process converges uh, super fast to its stationary regime. Um, some notes. Um, First of all, this Q also appears in the Wasserstein distance. Yeah, I skipped a bit over this. I feel like yeah, this Q is here and it's in zero to one, one included. Um, for the proof, it kind of just uses results uh, from these two papers. Uh, so this is kind of like a simple result that, that we got. Um, we don't necessarily need the convexity assumption. We can also replace it by, by some uh, uh, bracket, condi uh, bracket condition, which I think is much more difficult than this convexity assumption, which is kind of why I took it, uh, but it should be like a bit weaker than the convexity assumption, uh, but much, much harder to work with. Um, and okay, do we actually know what we converge to? Uh, probably not. Um, I mean, there are some ideas on how one could compute something like this, but um, I have tried several of them and it hasn't really worked yet for me. I mean, if one of you has ideas, um, please let me know. Um, that would be very interesting if we could do that, but it is something very non-standard, uh, certainly. Okay, and the decreasing learning rate case. Um, so now we don't look at the convergence to some specific measure, but we look at the convergence to this uh, delta uh, uh, measure in the true value. Um, and what we get is essentially the same convergence result um, plus some alpha of epsilon. Yeah, and it's a bit like uh, uh, the, the critical value. So, I mean, uh, we know that um, alpha is zero at zero but uh, we always have this kind of, um, yeah, this kind of term, we don't really get rid of it. So we know that we converge arbitrarily close to this delta function um, and arbitrarily close we get with exponential speed. If we actually reach the delta function with exponential speed, um, I don't know yet, but I hope I can find out. And what is interesting about this, and okay, it's a bit like comparing apples and Appears, but this is much, much faster than stochastic gradient descent is. And okay, it's a continuous time process, so probably I, uh, I shouldn't take this too serious. But um, I mean, there is this sort of belief, I think, in the community that um, we can improve this um, only by doing some variance reduction type technique, yeah, like Zaga or, um, um, or stochastic variance reduced gradient does. Um, but actually, we show here that we have a local in time process uh, that does not depend on, uh, on previous steps in some variance reduction uh, sense, and it still converges super fast. Uh, so, I mean, while in stochastic gradient descent, the conversion rate is sort of worse due to the stochasticity, it doesn't get super worse. I mean, it doesn't get super bad. Um, I think there might be a question. 
Yeah, so just wondering, do you want questions along the way, just to be sure? Um, no, no, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy right now. Because, so, uh, I mean, so, so one of the main reasons to, okay, so there are many reasons to use HDD, but if your functional is, if your functional are convex anyway, then uh, who cares about stochasticity? Just do standard gradient descent, and then you can also get exponential, exponential convergence. Um, so, so, so in some sense, the the fact that you're assuming convexity of the of the potentials means that uh, somehow the typical situation where you would like to use the stochasticity of SGD in a in a helpful way is exactly not the one that you're interested in. Um, I mean that that is like um, uh, a true for for like the classical machine learning setting. I would say uh, yes, but um, I'm looking at, I'm looking a lot at like image reconstruction. Or you have like mm -hmm. positron emission tomography images, which have like 35 million, uh, 30, 35 million data points, and those are convex. Ah, okay. Then you yeah, also want to use the uh, the batch reduction. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, okay. Because there's no memory big enough. Uh, but I mean, I, thought, I okay. totally agree that this setting is like ah. kind of a boring one uh, yeah. because it's convex. I mean, obviously, a non-convex setting is more interesting, but also in convex optimization, we still like it. Yes, and your e to the power minus t, of course, gets more complicated in the in non-convex one because then the then the metastability is going to play a role. While while this is already interrupted, can I ask: Do you need all the potentials to be convex, or do you just need the sum, the weighted sum, to be convex? Um, so in this setting, uh, in the constant line rate setting, the weighted sum is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the other setting, I at the moment need all of them to be to be convex. Okay. Um, I just simplify the slides a bit to not have two different sets of assumptions. But for the first one, it's a bit easier actually. There you're right. The weighted sum is sufficient. Yeah. And here, I believe you could also show it, uh, but but I couldn't at the time. But I, I'm hopeful that you can actually show it. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay, and uh, 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 this proof doesn't doesn't really follow from this uh, theory because I think what is going what is go going wrong here is um, this rate ma rate matrix uh, B. It sort of degenerates. Yeah, I mean it will just con contain like infinities and minus infinities as t goes to infinity, um, making this proof pretty difficult and not really fitting into any setting. Um, and uh, that is why this is sort of yeah, one of the main contributions, I think, of this work. It's actually showing that you can use these theories together to get such a result. OK, and uh, some example, I mean, obviously a very simple example where you probably wouldn't use stochastic gradient descent normally, uh, but let's do it anyway for the fun. Um, I mean, uh, obviously, if you have such a, such a linear problem you want to solve, yeah, I mean, you want to find this uh, uh, theta as a vector, this G, gi are matrices, this yi is some data, and we want to uh, train this model. Um, and then we subsample by not considering the sum, but by only taking these parts of the sum. And then we get uh, these assumptions will be satisfied if um, yeah, the dimension of the parameter space is smaller than the dimension of the data spaces and the matrices have full rank. Um, or for instance, I mean, we usually um, use some regularization in such a case. Yeah, and if you just add a regularizer to each of these subpotentials, uh, this will always work. Uh, okay, so that's not too spectacular what we, what we ask for here, but also this is a really simple problem. Okay, um, so how do we get on with it? I mean, what do we do in practice with this result? Um, so if we want to apply our method in practice, we somehow need to get back to from a continuous uh, time to, to discrete time by, uh, by actually discretizing these gradient flows. Um, and I mean, okay, we know how to discretize gradient flows, but what is not so clear to me is, um, what type of discretization is really the one that we're looking for? Yeah, okay, I mean, we already know from SGD that doing just Ford Euler is not the best way to go, but we somehow also don't really need these to be super accurate in terms of discretization, but what we actually want is to 
get the same ergodic behavior. Yeah, so kind of retain this uh, Wasserstein convergence result. And that is not really clear to me. So I will show you some examples where I just used um, RK45. Um, and I mean, that's obviously like super slow and it doesn't make any sense for, for practical application, but we kind of see what is going on because it's just very accurate. Uh, discretizing these continuous Markov processes um, is not too big a problem either uh, because these waiting time distributions are usually quite simple in our case. Uh, so, I mean, for this uh, constant learning rate case, we just sample exponential distributions. Yeah, that is in MATLAB or Python or whatever you use. It's just a standard or probably sci-fi. Uh, it's just a standard command. Um, in the case where uh, the way to, uh, where these learning rate is, uh, is actually decreasing, it's not as easy, but um, if your learning rate is not too complicated, yeah, it's not too complicated a function of t, then you can sometimes even like write down like a quantile function of this distribution. And I did this for one example in, in the paper uh, as well. So that's not too big a problem either. Um, otherwise, we could also say, I mean, why do it this difficult? Why not just do it as in stochastic gradient descent, at least when discretizing it? Um, I mean, there, okay, I don't really have, no, have an opinion there. I mean, probably we should do numerical tests uh, to see whether um, it really makes sense or it's really necessary to do this um, random waiting time stuff or whether just using fixed waiting times and sample from this uniform distribution is actually sufficient. Um, what is interesting, if we do the second approach, we essentially go back to SGD in terms of subsampling. Um, and use some particular time stepping methods. We don't get uh, only SGD with forward Euler, but there's like a whole zoo of methods we can uh, reconstruct with this idea. Yeah, if we use a backward Euler method, we get stochastic proximal point. Um, if we use a control variant with our forward Euler, we get this linear complexity um, stochastic gradient models. Or if we want to use a higher order scheme, I mean, there's also higher order SGD methods. Um, yeah, and we kind of recover those. Uh, so those are contained in the model to some extent. Okay, and then some figures for the end. I mean, first, how do actually these stage three measures look like for the constant learning rate case? And how do they compare to the station measures, which okay, may or may not uh, be well-defined for SGD? And it's just a very similar numerical study. And for the decreasing, decreasing learning rate case, um, how does this distribution uh, change over time when t gets large? And again, a very simple problem. Yeah, just one dimensional, so we can draw figures. Uh, we have three data sets now. Uh, yeah, so we observe that theta is um, minus two, is 1.5, and is uh, plus two. And so the minimizer of this should end up at 0.5. Okay, um, so what I did here is I simulated uh, the stochastic gradient process up to time um, uh, time 10, so t equals 10, and it started at minus 1.5. And I did this 10,000 times and I did kernel density estimations. Uh, and these orange uh, plots are these kernel density estimates for different learning rates. Um, I did sort of the same for SGD, where I also went up to time two, uh, also went, went up to time 10, which is sort of, which is 10 over whatever learning rate eta is in this case. And I started at the same point, and I also did this 10,000 times. And I plotted again, current kind of Lindsay estimates uh, with some plaque. And okay, what is interesting, okay, they look very similar. Um, and okay, SGD has a slightly smaller variance, and indeed it seems to be like a constant factor with which, with which is a smaller which I have no explanation for, uh, but which is at least interesting. And I mean, what we also see is that if eta gets smaller, we sort of get more, we get closer to what the true value is that was 0.5 here, yeah, which is also consistent with what we would um, sort of expect in this case. Um, for uh, the decreasing learning rate, um, so now we need this function h of t, uh, which tells us how we decrease in our learning rate and which I just choose to be such a rational function or one over a linear function. Yeah, in this case, computing the, the weighting that distribution is very easy. Um, and, yeah, and when we notice distribution, we can just sample with the quantile function of this. 
And this essentially is um, this plot I showed you in the very beginning, where we have um, at the bottom the process a J of t, which tells us which data set to pick at which time. And at the top, we combine all our gradient flows into one plot. Um, yeah, and here you really see how these are how these are linked actually. Yeah, so whenever this switches, we also have a switch here. And you also see that over time uh, we switch more often. Yeah, well here we have really long time intervals where we are staying at one state. Uh, yeah, it gets way more chaotic. Uh, chaotic is not the right word, but uh, uh, yeah, we have way more variation uh, back here. Um, and now what I found really interesting is when you look at kind of density estimates of this process at different points in time. Uh, so I started at one over four, going up to 10. Because what we see, okay, is like we slowly move from left to right. And um, we also um, move from very wide distributions to very uh, narrow distributions. Yeah, okay, which makes perfect sense in our, in what we would expect. Yeah, what we've also what we've seen here. Um, indeed, if we compare our distribution here, to the last distribution at time of uh, uh, time 10 uh, here, they are almost identical, which makes sense uh, because our function h uh, is giving us about the same learning rate that we had uh, for eta in this case. Yeah, so that's sort of what we would expect or what we'd hope for that uh, this coincides. Um, what really remind what what this really reminded me of, and that is why I'm hoping that uh, we can extend this theory to non-convex settings, is um, this really reminded me of, of a simulated annealing uh, um, scheme. Uh, uh, so we start with very flat, very wide distributions that allow us a lot of variation, and also in non-convex settings. But over time, we converge to something. Um, very concentrated. And in simulated annealing, you would actually converge here also for a non-convex functional, you would converge to the global minimizer. I mean, that's obviously like very far-fetched now, but uh, this uh, a connection of learning rates and temperatures, um, I think is a very worthwhile one, actually. Okay, and then coming to an end, um, what did we do? So we introduced a continuous time model for stochastic gradient descent, allowing us to represent non-asymptotic learning rates. Um, we are able to capture most properties of stochastic gradient descent with this model. And I think I explained to you uh, all of these. Uh, okay, more on a side note, we have also a biological interpretation. Then we can show convergence in the constant uh, the learning rate case to a unique stationary measure at exponential, at exponential speed. When learning uh, rate is uh, decreasing, we converge at least to a neighborhood of uh, at a true point. Yeah, so we actually have a chance to reach a true point at exponential speed. And we cannot only represent SGD, but also other stochastic optimization methods with our approach. And then, I mean, I also mentioned uh, in the beginning or several times during the talk, yeah, there's many other things one could do with this or I'm currently doing with this. Uh, yeah, so for instance, how do you actually discretize this uh, and get, uh, get a method that is interesting for applications? Yeah, which is not just RK45. Then, I mean, SGD is also used in constraint optimization. Uh, having constraints actually is not uh, it's not a very big problem. Yeah, you could just say uh, you can jump in your post whenever you hit a boundary, which is similar to uh, what people in SGD do, which is like projecting on a set which satisfies the constraints. Um, then, of course, non convex optimization, it's very interesting. Um, then, also in other continuous time algorithms, uh, introducing subsampling and studying the subsampling. Yeah, so for instance, in these imaging um, PDEs or also in data simulation, which would be like a very different setting. And uh, okay, and finally, and I mentioned this before, uh, we don't really know what this, what this stationary distribution pi c does. And um, 
some people claim it's related to posterior density, which I uh, do agree with, um, but I don't know yet how it is related. It would also be interesting to figure out. And I think I end with a photo of a mathematical bridge and two people punting. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Jonas. That's a really nice talk. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask them, or you can write something in the chat and I can, I can read it out. Um, yeah, so, I mean, maybe, maybe whilst we're waiting, oh, Mark, do you, you're, you just unmuted yourself. Yes. You... yes, so thanks very much, Jonas. Uh, very, very, very interesting. <clears throat> um, I, I, was, I was intrigued by the remark you made about uh, Hermann the conditions as an alternative for a convexity condition. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain how that would work? It, it somehow okay. So the reason why I'm asking is that, of course, in metastable cases, you expect a completely different dependence of the uh, of the convergence rate on some kind of trade-off between the energy hump you have to get over on one hand and some kind of measure of noise on the other hand. So I was wondering, is there a connection between this and these Hermann conditions? Um, I'm not entirely sure, to be fair. Um, so. Um, I mean, the Hermann conditions, I think, um, I think, are mostly necessary to actually show the existence of such a stationary measure. Uh, because um, the problem is uh, usually when you, for instance, okay, in this case, we, we argue with Wasserstein distance, that wouldn't be a problem actually. Um, but if you argue with photon variation distances, uh, you need to be uh, like on, on the same space, you cannot have a measure that's similar to your measure. Uh, so you need these Hermann conditions uh, to show that your process is like sufficiently mixing, yeah, your ODEs are sufficiently mixing. Um, and this is indeed then sufficient uh, to show exponential convergence of the, um, of the process in, uh, in the TV distance. Um, however, um, for a problem that is more complicated than something strongly convex, uh, I would really struggle with trying to show uh, like Hermann bracket conditions, like Lee bracket conditions. Um, I mean, I wouldn't know how to do that. Um, I guess, I mean, if, if like say, okay, we take a new network with like, uh, with like one layer and uh, uh, with, with, like, with like one hidden layer and ReLU functions or sigmoid functions, there may be something one could do if it's not getting, getting too, too complicated. Uh, mm. okay. But in general, I would find it difficult. Thanks. I think I wasn't really answering your question. Uh, I think I wasn't really answering your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no worries, no worries. Um, can I ask another question? So you, um, it, you've got the uh, you've got the uh, this form that the uh, that the energy functional is a weighted, uh, weighted sum. And um, obviously uh, you then think about uh, using, uh, using stochasticity because you've got very large data sets, in which case this average sum approaches something like an expectation. And in the, in the traditional diffusion model, I, I can see how, how to incorporate a continuum of data. Uh, can you do that in this, in this way as well? Um, I don't think. Um, I mean, um, to some extent, I could, I could, I could, I could imagine that this would actually work, uh, but not with this uh, uh, particular theory. Uh, so this is really built on. There's only the finite, or I think countable would probably work as well. Uh, there's, but say there's only like a finite number of data of data sets. Um, I think the con uh, the continuum setting is very interesting, or something I would like would, I would like to explore. Um, but you sort of leave then this area of piecewise deterministic Markov processes, I think, or at least part of the theory. Uh, but for instance, what happens if you uh, look at the actual at the, at the actual stochastic differential equation? Um, for your continuum setting, because there it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there I totally agree that this is like the correct model. Uh, if you have a continuum of data, uh, that would be very interesting. Um, I would really like to like to see what what the outcome of this, this would be. I mean, some of the let's say the more theoretical analyses of SGD 
they do exactly this, right? They simply dispense with the idea of having a finite or countable data set. And they say, every time we run our SGD, we just draw from whatever distribution we're talking about. And we don't care about whether this is finite, infinite, or whatever. And so, so it seems there's quite a few things that you described would also apply to that situation, wouldn't it? Um, it um, uh, um, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm uh, oversimplifying. Um, That's possible. Um, um, I mean, I think that your um, your piece was that uh, your um, your continuous Markov processes that live on this finite set. Um, I think it would be difficult to, to actually define them in this way on a continuous set. Uh, ah, okay. So I think that is like where it breaks a little bit. Yeah, because on a continuous set, you would rather have something like a diffusion process, or maybe also like something driven by an ODE. Um, it might be possible, but I'm really not sure. I mean, probably not 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 enough expert uh, uh, in this field. Uh, but um, I think it would be hard to carry over from these results to a continuous uh, space setting, uh, continuous data setting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then I've got one more question and then I'll shut up, I promise. Um, and uh, namely, uh, so you've got these uh, intervals on which you're solving a gradient flow for a fixed, uh, fixed potential. Um, and uh, you used uh, some higher order runge cutter method. Could you, could, uh, uh, can you imagine what, ha uh, could you just keep doing explicit Euler, but with a time step size that is small with respect to the length of the interval? Um, I guess, I guess, um, I would, guess that, would, um, would, would that approximate the right thing? that should approximate uh, the right thing. I mean, I think one problem in particular with explicit Euler in this setting is that, I mean, even in this like squared, like linear squared setting, uh, this would usually be, be actually quite stiff. So like explicit methods are actually not that interesting uh, at all for this. And that's actually why like stochastic proximal point works quite well, which does this, but um, uh, yeah, with, uh, with the implicit Euler method. Um, so, um, um, I mean, in this particular setting, uh, this particular linear squared setting, there may be even like there, there may be even better ideas from linear algebra what what to use there, because it's just a matrix exponential. Yeah, in the end, yeah, uh, that you could even solve it, solve analytically. Um, I mean, smaller step sizes in explicit Euler can be a good idea, um, but like stiffness stiffness remains. And no, I see. Thank you. Can I ask you, Jonas, about the uh, switching rate? So I can't quite remember now how it was all defined. So I guess, um, well, I guess first of all, does your switching rate, does it either have, or could it possibly have the property that it can depend on the gradient of your potential? So in particular, I'm thinking of if you're, you know, if you're doing gradient descent in a particular direction, and this direction is very steep, then of course that's maybe a direction you want to keep on um, choosing, whereas if you hit a flat direction, then of course maybe then you want to sort of move. Um, 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 I mean, I'm, uh, in my theory, I'm not actually allowing this, uh, but you could do that. And that actually wouldn't, um, okay, it would be some more work, but that would still be part of this class of piecewise deterministic microprocessors. Uh, so you could, uh, you could do that. Uh, the question is, how simple is it, is it then to actually sample these switching rates? Uh, because that, for instance, is a problem when you look at these uh, Markov chair Monte Carlo methods that use these type of techniques. Because they usually have the problem that uh, solving the ODE is quite simple because it's usually just uh, it's, it's just like a constant ODE. Yeah, right inside is constant. Uh, but the bottleneck really is uh, sampling these sw switching rates because then you suddenly have a PDE inside of your waiting time distribution, which yeah, it's not it's not really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could imagine that this works, and you could also probably get similar results for this. Okay, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, um, I mean I could imagine that there's similar theories possible. Uh, but um, actually applying this correctly would be much, much harder. Okay, thanks. Okay, I guess if there are no further questions, um, 
thank Jonas again. It was a very interesting talk. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I think we're back next week at the usual time. I think the time zone changes have all happened now. Um, um, yeah, so thank you very much, everyone, and see you next week.